It's a treat to be here at the Digital Quality uh, Summit. My first time, and I, th I think it's actually an extraordinary gathering of folks who are worried about some of the same problems from a variety of different vantage points. And I think the work that I've seen underway yesterday and hope to see today has been extraordinary. What I'd like to do is kind of touch on the big ideas as I see them in healthcare today, and maybe you see them this way as well, and then kind of zoom in from 10,000 feet or so, uh, thinking about how we reason nowadays in healthcare, how we manage the information flow and the knowledge flow, and how we actually execute, if you will, measures and decision support at the point of care. It's clear that we are in the midst of a very fundamental transformation or transition, a really sort of epical change. I'm, I'm reminded of the George Engel model of biopsychosocial, biopsychosocial model of healthcare delivery or of medicine. And I think we really need to amend that now and say something like the biopsychosocial digital model of healthcare delivery. Because truly, the way patients are engaging with generating their own healthcare data, patient generated healthcare data, patient reported outcomes, and the influx of all the various types of data uh, into the clinical care setting is truly extraordinary, as well as the, the amount of data being generated and used outside of traditional healthcare delivery settings by the likes of the tech giants and others. But I think about gathering the clinical data once and reusing it for every purpose that it needs to be used for, reusing it for all purposes, uh, putting the patient at the center truly in, in, in what that might mean for your individual care, not just population-based care, engaging the patient as a care collaborator for shared decision-making, generating data, follow-up, and the like. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, and it's come up here already, the idea of sharing computable knowledge artifacts so that each and every one of us doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, whether it be an ECQM or a CDS measure specification or a, an e-pathway. And the real trick is to do all of this at scale so that we can all benefit, if you will, with a digital superhighway for healthcare. Not that we haven't talked about that before, the National Healthcare Information Network and other kinds of ideas, but one in which these transactions can flow and from which we can really derive insight. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about clinical reasoning. Uh, I'm a primary care doc, practiced 25 years, 20 of those years on EMRs that I helped to design and create. So I truly had to eat my own dog food. Peter knows the story, uh, way back when with Medical Logic, and then Partners Healthcare Systems, uh, and then Vanderbilt. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the evolution of knowledge engineering as it pertains to healthcare IT. And then this idea of uh, the impact of clinical information and knowledge management uh, on the industry scale with using the Apravita platform as a reference. So in Washington, I, I think this is still a safe political cartoon. <laughs> I hope so. But we all remember, of course, and are still emerging from the meaningful use era David Blumenthal mentioned yesterday, and he had a big hand in this. But certainly, the investment we've made in the High Tech Act, uh, part of ARA, uh, was considerable, 39 billion by anyone's estimation. And from that, it's not clear at all that we've gotten the potential return on investment that we expected. At the Center for IT Leadership in Boston, Partners Healthcare and Harvard, we estimated that if you could simply transact data from one clinical encounter to the next, whether it be the, the PCP, a specialist, but transact all the relevant interactions to the laboratory, to the radiology center, to public health, to the retail pharmacy and whatnot, if all those transactions could be done seamlessly with syntactic and semantic integrity, that would save this country about 78 billion a year. Further, we estimated that if in primary care alone, we had good clinical decision support operating at the point of care, across the billions of, of, of uh, primary care visits, billions of retail pharmacy or uh, uh, clinical prescriptions and the like, outpatient primary care decision support alone was worth another 44 billion. It was John Berkmeyer at Dartmouth who estimated that inpatient CPOE would have value around 30 billion if broadly supported with decision support. So those become kind of real numbers, 44 plus 78 plus 30, 
I think even in Washington, that's, that's, those are real numbers, yet we're not really achieving that value proposition at all. And one might ask why. I think fundamentally there are three big problems. The usability problem is well known, described, and discussed. I'm not going to talk about that here, but we need to improve the human-computer interaction for docs and the clinical team and perhaps ultimately the patient with our clinical information systems. Number two is the interoperability challenge. It's still challenging to send information, even with fire, unless there's political will. Technology actually is becoming less and less of a problem. There has to be political will to share information across potentially competing members of a uh, medical community. Uh, and, and third, though the most important, which I'd like to dwell on today, is this absence of the shareable knowledge artifact. I think the ECQM space is leading the way in some ways that we have now ECQM specifications that I can readily import, digest, and use. We need to do exactly the same thing for clinical decision support and pathways, and CQL is a step in the right direction. I'll come back to that. So we're not getting our return on investment. The physicians, clinicians aren't happy, and I think policymakers and payers similarly seem frustrated with the current state of the world, despite the noble and lofty and really seemingly achievable objectives of the, the MU campaign. So how is clinical reasoning changing? How many of you have searched yourself for information about your medication or a medical problem or family member's problem? Now, half of you aren't being honest, so I know. <laughs> I think, you know, the data would show that almost everybody, good 80%, 90% are online, and healthcare tends to be the number one topic, you know, in many, in many studies. And, you know, it's, it's curious to think about how we reason across what we find in Google. How many of you allow Google to be pursued or, or, or your iPhones to be used at the dinner table? Or how many of you have a policy against? Okay, you're not being honest again. No. <laughs> you know, this is, this is the challenge. I think reasoning itself is changing. Back in the day, one would synthesize the evidence, kind of weigh it all, do some assessment of patient preferences, and try to come up with a decision, as Chuck alluded to, about potentially complicated patients, consult with uh, subspecialists and the like, and in the age of instant on-demand knowledge, I worry about our reasoning capabilities. I worry that the clinician and the doctor-patient together have to reason over instant knowledge and really understand how to interpret it and apply it in their specific context. It's also true that the big data era is here. I won't dwell here for long, but the amount of data going on online is incredible. We certainly have the quantified self. How many of you have a iPhone monitoring your steps in your pocket or any form of quantified self device? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing actually. And, and those data can be helpful in the clinical context. It may be though that Google and Facebook and Apple figure out how to use those data before we actually do in healthcare. And that's another concern I have. If they figure out how to monetize those data, one way or another for adver advertising or insurance coverage or engaging you in programs or what have you, that's not going to be as good. Well, it's not the only thing that we have to do. We have to figure out how to bring that into the clinical care setting as well. So these data are going online in inexorable or, you know, extabyte numbers, whatever that means. It's probably 14, 16, 19 zeros, I'm not sure. But the, the amount of data going online is incredible. And the physician, the poor physician just feels, you know, kind of overwhelmed in, in the clinical context. Patients are going online as well. I differ a little bit here with Dr. Blumenthal. I think that patients actually are going online in, in great numbers as, as demonstrated by the ONC brief in, in April of this year. That patients can be engaged online and, and that engagement can be very, very powerful. In a experiment, set of experiments we did in Boston, we actually gave the patient a diabetes co-management module to use with their primary care doc. I mentioned this yesterday briefly. And 75% of patients afforded that opportunity to fill out a pre-visit questionnaire, did so. Pretty good engagement. More importantly, perhaps, 75% of the doctors receiving those pre-visit questionnaires opened them up and examined them. And in a randomized control trial, those docs were more likely to actively and appropriately manage the patient's diabetes meds. So I think the punchline there is that we certainly have huge problems of inertia in medicine with protracted decision-making, multiple visits for the same problem and whatnot. 
but perhaps if we have an activated patient, we can activate the doctor. So what is happening? What is the why behind this? Herb Simon was the guy who won the Nobel Prize for recognizing that information consumes attention. And that in, in fact, it's, it's the, the wealth of information that creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it is sort of our prime objective. I think that the clinician role, and Chuck alluded to this, is changing. We're no longer gonna be the omniscient oracle if we ever even were, for heaven's sakes. We need to be much more now of an information broker and a collaborator in shared decision making to help interpret and synthesize the evidence and then weigh preferences and utilities from a patient and their coverage and family setting, context, et cetera, to make decisions. The second gray-haired old man I'd like to share with you is uh, Abraham Flexner. And the, the, uh, related to the Google search phenomenon is this. It's taking way too long to get information once codified in the medical literature as a credible, validated new finding. The uh, Andrew Ballas and others published the st statistic that it was 17 years to get a new finding into routine clinical practice. Well, that's simply unacceptable. Flexner found in his famous 1910 survey that the uh, society reaps at this moment but a small fraction of the advantage which current knowledge has the power to confer. So I suggest part of our savings potential has to be to dramatically accelerate the translation and specification of new knowledge and incorporation into practice. That we need to go from 17 years to 17 minutes. Imagine if the next Zika uh, outbreak or the next anthrax uh, 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 attack or concern or the next medication recall, imagine if that knowledge was made available to each and every practitioner at the point of care in 17 minutes rather than 17 years. I think that's what we have to shoot for. We know we're not actually complying with the best evidence. Care gaps has come up several times over in the past day. Uh, care gaps are legion in healthcare. Beth McGlynn did the famous study, now a little long in the tooth, but it's been replicated. Looking at practice across the country, she found that compliance with recommended guidelines at best might be 54%, 55% of the time overall. So many have said famously, you know, this is healthcare in the US is no better than a coin toss. Now, this can be interpreted a variety of ways, but still, what we all seek, I think, is to close the care gap, to minimize the care gap, such that the best evidence is being applied to each and every clinical encounter. So how are we going to do that? Cognitive aids, decision support, all the kinds of tools we wish to have at our disposal, just like the tools I have in my iPhone to do everything else in my life. I no longer look at a map, Google Maps, Apple Maps, whatever. GPS is the only way to travel, of course. We do not yet really have GPS for healthcare. So how's it gonna work? Scott Blois presciently back in 1980 wrote an article in the New England Journal when, when expert systems were just coming out, QMR DT and Mycin from Stanford, uh, QMR from Pittsburgh, Mycin from Stanford, DXplain from Mass General. These were differential diagnosis systems that would try to make a differential diagnosis on behalf of uh, the patient and the doc. He thought that there were two spots in this cognitive funnel where diagnostic uncertainty was progressively narrowed by the use of these tools, and he thought the patient should be at one of these points and the expert system should be at the other. Time for a quiz. How many of you think the patient, I mean the uh, provider, I'm sorry, should be at point B? How many think the provider should be at point A? Now if this is working, how many of you think the expert system should be at point B? Okay, you're really asleep. <laughs> Everyone still passes, no worries. What he said was, in fact, that the expert systems really were at point B, where the final reduction of diagnostic uncertainty required precise calculations and use of knowledge bases and whatnot that we weren't really equipped to do. That we as humans, our reasoning capabilities were much more useful at the broad end of this cognitive funnel or, or where uncertainty is the most because we reason well over uncertainty. We do well with the, the fence post problem. Where do you look for the keys? Not just where the light is, you know, or, or where reasoning runs into a fence post. 
I think though that in the era of a cognitive aid for each and every clinical problem, for each and every clinical setting, we really need to have the human in the middle of two AIs. And these AIs I describe as follows. One, the AI which distills the big data into the big patterns, if you will, or the, the big heuristics that might be used to reduce the initial cognitive dis, uh, uncertainty. And we still need to have uh, diagnostic decision support or uh, uh, expert systems reasoning at point B, but I think the human's in the middle. So this human AI dyad is, needs to be a subject of great study so we can figure out how to manage uncertainty and leverage these expert systems as they come forward and become more useful uh, in, in real terms. Okay, so how do we move from dumb healthcare to smart healthcare? I think in many ways, our current infrastructure, frankly, is still largely dumb. We have EMR, we have patient portals, we have EDWs, et cetera, but they're really not doing the things that I would want to them, them to do as a clinician. Predict, forewarn, survey, discover, advise, guide, uh, monitor, allow me to provide feedback, and then learn. Learn as you will, not only at the population level, but at the individual patient, so that I know Mrs. Smith, this came up in discussion yesterday, her normative BP might actually be 140 by 90. And, in, and the guideline isn't really appropriate to get her under 130 by 80 or what have you. We need to have these norms considered at the individual patient level as well. So I've said already, I think the central problem, oops, is that it's too hard for the average institution to create, code, implement, maintain, support, monitor, all these knowledge artifacts that we need and want to use at the point of care. It's, it's, too, it's so hard to transform care, even with the best health IT, because of this chasm of knowledge encoding, specification, translation, implementation, and use. I'd much rather go to a library download an ECQM, take a look at it, make sure it's fitting my data, my context. Similarly, download an ECDS, download an ePathway, or even download a Smart on Fire app and say, is this gonna fit my context so I don't have to invent that thing myself? We call this a system of insight, as do many others. The transactional infrastructure is now in place. We've spent 39 billion getting greater than 90% adoption of healthcare IT. Uh, we have the same healthcare IT oftentimes serving as the system of engagement. So the system of record and the system of engagement are generally covered, but we don't really have yet this system of insight that can sit on top of multiple disparate EMRs, gather data from multiple uh, uh, context, uh, the context of care from multiple settings, and then deliver insight to wherever the insight needs to be delivered. I did a whole bunch of experiments in this area, when in Boston, still at the Brigham, called the CDS Consortium Research. We took knowledge artifacts from Partners Healthcare, put them into the cloud, and made them available to remote EMRs across the country. Those included uh, NextGen, GE, the Regan Shreve EMR, um, Epic, and uh, our own EMR at Partners, the Longitudinal Medical Record. And over the course of five years, we really cut our teeth on all the typical problems, the semantic normalization, the, the data integration, the, in, the coding and, and consensus on what knowledge artifacts were going to be used and implemented across uh, this environment. But it was a success. We had a couple million transactions, lots of clinicians, 50, much, uh, 50 plus rules, I'm sorry, 11 rules, 50 plus classification rules, 375 immunization rules, all running from the cloud, architected at partners, we had a big knowledge engineering group so that the uh, folks in uh, Mid Valley IPA, Salem, Oregon, didn't have to do any of it. They just decided if they were going to use it, plug it in and, and, and uh, run with it. In this research, however, in, in the mid 2000s, we found that the system variability in the knowledge management decision support capabilities of EMRs was highly variable. Uh, there were 42 things we looked for, 42 uh, features that we were look for, looking for, and the best system had uh, only one single missing feature, and the worst had 18 missing. So the performance characteristics, the infrastructure, if you will, the chassis of the EHR 
is still widely, was then widely variable and still is, I think, to this, degree, to this day, but getting better. So this dramatic variability in CDS capability among the commercial systems uh, was unexpected and a, and a cause for concern. Another piece of work in this research looked at the knowledge management capabilities of these commercially available leading systems and found them to be largely lacking, largely wanting, in a, in, a, in a way looking at formal knowledge management and the whole knowledge management life cycle to maintain, update, refine, delete knowledge artifacts as the knowledge base was changing and, and to have a whole comprehensive curation process for that activity. So I suggest that these findings and that successful experiment suggest the need for externalizing knowledge inference, uh, inference and, and use of knowledge artifacts, and then we run into the challenge of how to represent knowledge. Well, over the decades, there's been a lot of work looking at just this problem in informatics, uh, how to take evidence and experience, form a consensus document or a guideline, represent that in a computable knowledge artifact, make that shareable, and then execute it in, 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 a, in a EHR agnostic way, in other words, across any EHR implementation. So this work, I think, has culminated based upon the CDS consortium work, the GLIDE's work of Rick Schiffman, at the same time supported by the ONC, and the healthy decisions effort, ONC sponsored by Jacob Ryder, which basically said we need to combine the way in which we represent eCQM and CDS knowledge artifacts, and that was the birth of CQL. And Bryn Rhodes is here somewhere. He and Chris Mosel and many others have put together the clinical quality language. So this is extremely helpful. As I've alluded to, I think the idea of all of us individually encoding and specifying guidelines into our EMRs is not realistic. The C2, the L2 idea of importing sort of a semi-structured document does not suffice, not enough encoding and specification to make it workable. The L3, however, is really consonant with the CQL notion, fully encoded, specified, translated, logic expressions, value sets, all of those things defined so that it, it, it becomes an interpretable knowledge artifact, which I can then use in my computer or in my cloud. And the CDS consortium demonstrated the uh, viability of a web services approach to sharing these knowledge artifacts in, the, in their computable form uh, as web services. Importantly also, from, from this perspective, we need to gather feedback from the implementation of knowledge artifacts or ECQMs, this also came up yesterday. How do we measure the performance characteristics of each so we can have a feedback loop uh, and inform authors and really create that learning health system? So that's what my current project is all about. Accelerating the knowledge translation from data information knowledge to insight and implementing that uh, in the cloud. Apravita is aimed at democratizing healthcare data and analytics. We believe this is too big a problem for any one of us to solve individually. We believe that healthcare increasingly is a networked activity, a networked uh, uh, industry, and that all of these different kinds of knowledge artifacts are amenable to implementing and sharing uh, via the cloud in a safe and secure way. I think this is part of a natural evolution from recognizing the need for data to aggregating data, to performing analytics on data, to then generalizing the application of, of those analytics to the enterprise context across your whole, whole healthcare delivery system, whether it's three clinics or 150 hospitals. But finally, we need to uh, begin to, to basically exchange all of those artifacts, as I've said, across the industry at, at large. So this is the system of insight idea again building upon that legacy, uh, the in transactional infrastructure of EHRs, working in conjunction and, and adding value, ideally to the EMR, and then using them uh, and other systems as the system of engagement. It's important to do this in another respect from a cloud perspective because it allows you to consider the multi-tenant, multi-affiliate type of model. Just like Amazon allows any number of different vendors to vend a book or a washing machine or, let's see, what did I buy today from Amazon? <laughs> um, you know, Amazon allows you to, to, of course, have any number of different vendors in their own private lockbox having a secure transaction with you. We have to do the same thing in healthcare. That is, 
allow for the multi-tenant, multi-affiliated kind of approach. I'll explain more about that in a minute. So we, we're now working on three different blueprints or, or platform ideas. The whole e-performance platform, the e-pathway ideas, and the idea of e-collaboration. I'll just talk about the first two today. My notion of decision support is much more than an alert or a reminder or an order set uh, or even a dashboard. It has to be all those things in concert that I can see a population profile, I can identify individual risk, I can act upon individual recommendations, and I can follow up and monitor, maintain a patient uh, across his or her lifespan and across multiple distinct problems. So we call this the 360 degree insight, where it's, again, more than just one type of intervention, it's all these interventions uh, in concert, but importantly, sharing the same fundamental logic under the covers from the guidelines, from the consensus statement uh, of the organization or what have you. We believe this actually supports comprehensively the e-pathway notion, a, a fully implementable e-pathway can be made up of different components doing different things at the different stages of the e-pathway, but all orchestrated or working in concert. And just to give another plug for CQL, this I think allows us to build CQL artifacts for each and every part and then to componentize them or reuse them as hierarchical knowledge objects, if you will, for an e-pathway. While you have the different kinds of artifacts running in the cloud, whether it be a measure or an e-pathway or a decision support, nowadays clearly it has to go to any number of different endpoints. It can't be just one EMR or another. Thanks to Fire and some of the other APIs, as well as the Smart and Fire container idea, uh, we can consider delivering the same insight to any number of different endpoints. That is a, a web service endpoint, whether it be the BI tool, multiple different EMRs, perhaps an Excel spreadsheet even, or a, a handheld uh, uh, patient-facing or provider-facing uh, tool, for example, a, a rounding tool, um, which we've done. So I'm just going to touch on two case studies quickly. The um, uh, that are of interest, I think, for this conversation. One is the CDC work, and the second is the work with the, the Joint Commission. For the CDC, we were engaged in a research contract to take a guideline kind of off the shelf, the 2015 STD guideline for uh, uh, gonorrhea care, and we translated that fully specified, encoded, and implemented uh, in the cloud context and delivered it to multiple different EMRs. The way this looks kind of visually is as follows. We start with the paper guideline, and this actually visualizes the L1234 knowledge translation, abstraction translation specification process my colleague Aziz Bakswala and I and others wrote about from the CDS consortium work. But this is a very deliberate and kind of uh, you know, careful uh, process for knowledge translation, abstraction, and specification. You start with a guideline, you convert it in a consensus process with SMEs, subject matter experts, into a visual flow diagram. What actually do they want to do in clinical practice? When does what happen? And to whom does it get expressed? And who is responsible for, for doing something about it? L3 is this notion of the fully encoded logic specification, value set specification, terminology bindings, uh, and the like. And then L4 is really taking the EHR agnostic L3 and implementing it into an execution environment, whether it be Python or Drools or your JavaScript or what have you. So we did that for the CDC and have now, uh, uh, we're implementing the, that STD gonorrhea guidance into um, uh, EPIC at the Brigham and GE at the Alliance of Chicago. And this can be done, as Chuck alluded to, with both fire services, fire API data services, as well as return of the uh, plan definition or an iframe or even a, a whole smart and fire app into the context of the EMR. We do need to improve the way services and smart and fire apps interact with host EMRs. This is still a work in process to be sure, but to the extent that the EMRs actually, I think, fully get it now, 
and they have the app stores, the app orchard, they have Cerner's uh, app store, uh, Athena, Health, and Allscripts and others. I think they realize that more knowledge for their customers is gonna be coming from the outside. And as Mark Overhage said at AMIA last week, or whenever that was, uh, he said, it's the ecosystem, stupid. <laughs> so really, we need to you know, have a collaborative environment where these APIs of the secure and, and, and uh, you know, steadfast EHR infrastructure can communicate value-added services to the customer. The next one I'll touch on briefly is the Joint Commission. The Joint Commission looked for a, a platform with which to, do, to re engineer their uh, data submission processes for uh, uh, accreditation and, uh, and um, certification by the Joint Commission. And we were lucky enough to win that bid. And with them, have built their direct data submission platform or, or application, which sits on the Appravita platform and takes directly from an, a Joint Commission accreditation seeking hospital, their data submissions for accreditation by the Joint Commission. What the app allows them to do though at the hospital site is to examine the data, assess its integrity, trial run the measures for accreditation and get early insight into whether or not they're gonna pass or fail. Uh, the end users love it. We're now up to uh, 900 plus hospitals uh, running for the Joint Commission and 3,600 is the target. So this is a good example, by the way, of the multi-tenant, multi-affiliate. The tenant is Joint Commission, if you will, with its own private secure lockbox, and then each hospital has their own private lockbox uh, underneath that uh, parent tenant. So in a way, I think the message I'd like to leave with you is, number one, let's focus on sharing knowledge. Let's make these knowledge artifacts, ECQMs, CDS knowledge artifacts, ePathways, all computable and shareable so that each and every person, clinic, hospital, system using EHRs can actually benefit. We won't address in this work only the interoperability challenge, we won't address the, the uh, usability challenge, but we certainly can address the value from decision support and quality measurement identify those care gaps and aim to fill them with recommendations for changes or improvements in care. We think we, we can talk to the CMS, obviously from MIPS and quality reporting, the Joint Commission, uh, we believe, the NCQA, of course, other healthcare delivery systems, the payer community, uh, combining clinical and payer data, and of course the CDC for case detection and case reporting can all be supported by this idea of externalized knowledge uh, sharing and, and decision support in the cloud. So I'll close just returning to the, the big ideas up front. We're not gonna get to all of these with this idea of uh, shareable knowledge artifacts and externalized inference, but we can get to some of them. Uh, I, and I think we're making demonstrable progress and we can standardize, streamline, and simplify uh, the way this is addressed across the, the, the infrastructure uh, with a system of insight. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Blackford, Linnell James, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. As you talk about that the L5, L4, 2L5, what's your perspective in terms of the EMR vendors being able to provide fire as the way to do that at scale across the ecosystem as it exists now? Well, you added the L5. I think you mean L3, L4? Yeah, L3, L4, but assuming L5 will be coming, sorry. Well, okay, that's another paper. <laughs> We need to write that one, happy to do it. Um, you know, right now the goal is that at the L4 level, whether it's the EMR implementing a shareable knowledge artifact like a CQL statement, an ECQM, or decision support artifact, that they, they are responsible for the executable environment in the context of an EMR. Um, I made the argument that the knowledge management, knowledge sharing, as well as distributed inference across multiple disparate EMRs suggests that it might be best done at a, in, a, in a cloud context. But where the EMRs specifically to address your question are, as, as I see it and, and hear it, you know, I think they fully are embracing fire. 
They're fully embracing the smart and fire ideas, not yet all in production. Uh, they're embracing the CDS hooks ideas, not yet all in production. So I have great hope, actually. And having been an EMR vendor, uh, recognize that you know, there's no way the vendor, him or herself, can actually do all the knowledge engineering that the customer wants to be done. Combine that with the fact that the customer can't do it all him or herself. Therefore, there's the need for this service. So I'm confident, actually, we're going to see fairly dramatic progress pretty quickly. Peter. Thank you, Blackford. Peter Basha, MedStar Health here in DC. Uh, you mentioned that um, we had the engagement level covered with the EHR, uh, sort of, kind of, maybe. For those of us who work with EHRs, we might consider it the disengagement layer. Um, and, and I mean that for clinicians and patients. So could you speak a bit yeah. as to how that engagement layer has to change so that um, clinicians and patients and caregivers can see uh, both the experience of care and the experience of improving quality as we provide care be something other than a, a screen staring experience? Thank you, Peter. It's an excellent question. I, I would not uh, suggest that the EMR is going to be the only system of engagement for, for patients especially. Our portals, you know, what's been developed with portals is really good. And the data would suggest that patients are going to portals. But of course, the first problem most patients have, I have three. Which one do I go to? You know, and this is the classic refrain. So I think the system of engagement that actually will emerge for patients, David Blumenthal already talked about it. You know, when HealthKit allows me to access any of my records data from any record system and apply from wherever the logic and inference that I might be interested in as a patient on my phone, that gets really interesting. Because then you're actually carrying, you know, the best evidence with you. You have a way to integrate it across CMRs, and you have a device with a good UI with which to do it. So I think the patient space actually is going to grow real quickly. And as I said earlier, you know, if, if, if and you said it already too, if we don't do it, Google and, and Facebook and others will, uh, I'd still like to have the relationship with my patients. I still would like to, them to think that I'm involved in their decision making and their care. It's not a requirement, but it's a nice to have. Thank you very much.